Hi, uh, I'm very excited for um, who I'm going to be talking to today. It's Dr. John Higgins, um, who is a media consultant um, and does really amazing EDI work and is also a writer and um, all around genius, wonderful, wonderful human to know. So I'm excited to be sharing them and their work with all of you uh, and also very excited to be having the conversation that we're going to be having about sexism, boundaries, and consent. Um, Dr. John has spoken in several of the courses that I've offered and they always end in tears. Um, they should be here any second. Let me see if I can invite Dr. John. Dr. John, let's see. Um, in the meantime, I will tell you that I am offering a men's program coming up July 18th. It's a really um, extensive program. It's eight weeks. It has six recorded classes and eight live classes and two one-on-one -on -one sessions with me. Um, it's open to cis men, trans men, um, and anyone else who feels that it'll serve them. Um, I'm not going to be like gatekeeping who feels like it's a good class for them to take. Um, it's on a sliding scale. You are always welcome to make me an offer or um, let me know your budget. I truly have yet to turn anyone down ever in my life. Uh, wait, Dr. make it in here. Um, so the other thing that's coming up is um, the Vivian Vi's, um, uh three-week class. So they're teaching my six-week class in a, in a condensed version that starts on July 11th. Okay, Dr. John is here. Let's see if they can get in. Um, Dr. John, hello. I think uh, I've tried inviting people in the past and it doesn't work for some reason. Um, so if you can send a request, I can, I know that that works. Um, let's see if we can pull this off. <laughs> Hi. I think at the bottom you can send a request to join. Um, if you're not able to do it, I may have to start the live over because when I try to invite people, it doesn't, it just sends me like an error message. I appreciate you all sticking around while we sort out our tech, tech stuff. Are you able to request to join if not this has happened before so if you're not able to i can start the live over and you should be able to then that's worked in the past ah great i got it oh wait no wrong person someone else sent a request to join okay there we go all right, Dr. John, I found it. I let you in. Let's see if it works. Let's see, I said accept. Okay. Oh my God, we did it. We ah. did it, Joe. We, we did, did it. it. We did it, Joe. Okay. Hello. Uh, hello. So nice to see you. So great to see you too. I'm so happy to be here. Sorry, everybody. So I, so I'll be very transparent and say I was on the computer thinking that I could do it from the computer, and I ultimately had uh -oh. to download it from my iPad and had to set my iPad up. And so, but we're all good. Everything's good. Everything's good in the hood. I'm sorry that my meeting went a little bit long. I am in the midst of trying to get this book proposal out, and my um, my agent was just he's he, he. I sent over the draft that I had and. He had all these great notes, and so it's just really cool to be in a place where, um, yeah, I finally feel like I found someone who believes in me being able to sell this book. Um, so I'm really, really happy about it. But anyway. Well, that's a great thing to have to push a few minutes. That sounds like a really exciting meeting. So congratulations. Thank you so much. 
Hello, uh, friend from Africa. I see that someone said that they were from Africa. That's, That's really, really cool. Yeah, I wonder what time it is there. Um, well, I so I, I kind of introduced you a little bit, but I think okay. if you can share what you do because I think the last time I read your bio was at this point like a year and a half ago. <laughs> yeah, and a lot has changed since then. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and it's all good change. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is John, also known as Dr. John Paul. Um, I really would say that I am, um, one of the biggest things in terms of my tagline is that I am a writer. And so I'm constantly writing about media and um, the intersections of identity within media. So gender, race, and media. Um, more specifically, though, the stuff that we oftentimes overlook in media and having conversations about that. Um, I've been pulled into different spaces in the last few years to talk about justice, equity, and, um, and inclusion, um, but more, I've become more, more focused on, per se, um, really talking about access, right? Like, so what does, what does access to things look like? Um, who intentionally are the gatekeepers? Uh, what, what does oppression look like around gatekeeping? Um, and really thinking about this idea, too, about um, all the, in a, in a way, <laughs> what are all of the lies that we're told about um, oppression and injustice? And I really just kind of naming the, the gaslighting that happens around, you know, identity. So, you know, gaslighting around, you know, my blackness, the gaslighting that happens around my fatness or my non-binariness and all of that, right? All of the stuff in between. Mm -hmm. I really think that that's if in a nutshell, I had to say what I do is I am really the one that's blowing the whistle on all of the things that uh, ultimately um, are injustice related per se, whether it be in and out of media. Um, and yes, education is the thing for me too. I do teach. Um, I have done several training sessions for uh, for your organization. Um, and I ultimately am on, cons I'm consulting for a school back East right now. Um, and yeah, so it's just, it's, it's a, it's a medal of everything. I do you name it. I can do it. Um, yeah. So that's my impression of you, Dr. John. <laughs> <laughs> the ghetto. <laughs> you know, I really had to come to terms with this idea. Like, I think, I wonder if you experienced this growing up with your parents and, and maybe the media too, like this idea that we're supposed to choose one thing and then be like an expert in that one thing. And that it's like not advisable to be, you know, what has been called like a generalist. Right. Um, but I, my career, I've just had the complete opposite experience where it's like, I, it, it almost seems like I'm doing the same thing very consistently. I'm just doing it in different mediums and in different people. So, and I get the same, sort of vibe from from you and your yeah. work i mean i started out as an educator in the classroom and i still teach at night um i teach i was i tell you i teach teachers so that's my thing every teacher that you you know that your your children or everybody somebody else's child may have a lot of those teachers are the teachers that i'm teaching um mm -hmm. but i will say that i think a big part of that is moving the conversations that i'm having in the classroom to different outlets, right? So I'm moving them to, you know, Essence. I'm moving them to Ebony. I'm moving them to, you know, all of these big name places because these conversations are not happening. And when I say these conversations, what I'm talking about, you know, it was very interesting because I, I was asked to speak out of school recently and they the, the number one question they had for me was, well, you know, what would you tell, you know, a, a, a Black queer student about, you know, graduating from college? And the conversation was, they will tell you how to get the job, but they will not tell you anything about how to keep the job. And there are a lot of optics that you have to play, a lot of games that you have to play when once you get a job as a Black queer, a Black non-binary, a Black fat person, right? Like there are all of these games that no one tells you how to play when you get the job. So, you know, I, and, and I think that's kind of what I feel like I've been called to do in my work is really just kind of cut through can can I cuss I always ask can I cuss of okay, course. Yeah, right so the, the the bullshit there's a lot of bullshit that I think that the industry that that and I say in industry as a large concept right uh business higher ed like you know nonprofit, right there are all of these bullshit ideologies that mm -hmm. um are not given to people and I ultimately am the person that can see between each of those things so 
Yeah, I really appreciate when you were describing what you do, this idea of like being gaslit by the media, by society, by like dominant narratives that are promoted <laughs> with ads or TV or magazines. And I think that that really ties into a lot of the work of consent and boundaries. A lot of that is about unpacking that stuff and recognizing like what really is mine and what is coming from outside, what has come from outside and has gotten internalized how do I work against that to be myself, figure out what's authentic and listen to my body, find my needs, my desires, ask for what I want and create like a, you know, an aligned career and personal life for myself that doesn't mm -hmm. sound, um, you know, who I am or, or continue to kind of like wreck me and chip away at, at myself because I'm trying to into something that isn't really for me. Correct. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to talk about sexism and boundaries and consent. And so I, I would love to hear like just in that little nugget, like what, what comes up for you around mm -hmm. those things? Yeah. So I, it was interesting because when you reached out to me and said, hey, we want to have a conversation. I remember us, you know, talking about some other things. And I said, I think it's imperative. You know, I think the biggest thing for me in my journey is really learning the ways that, and I always like to say, it's so insidious. So, you know, when you think about it, so I'm a creator by nature and I'm always writing and I'm always dreaming up these worlds. And the only way I can really think about it is, I don't know if you've watched Stranger Things, but thinking about the little, you know, when they, when, so in this season, I'm not giving anything away for folks who haven't seen the newest season, but there's like these, I don't want to call them talons, but they're almost like vines and veins and stuff, right? And they're all connected to one thing. And, when, and what I mean by that is, is those vines, you know, so sexism, you know, racism, homophobia and all of that, they're all connected to white supremacy in one way, right? Um, and I think about the different ways that they all kind of play off of each other. And so when we get down the line of, you know, outside of racism, right? The way black women are treated, the way that black trans women are treated, right? When we start getting down to it and we start really getting down to, okay, what is sexism and what does sexism look like that I have I've come to understand is that we are taught, especially femmes, right? So if you're a black, if I as a, a cis woman, who is femme, right? Um, you are instantly taught from a very young age to hate who you are, right? Mm. Like you're, you, and I always think about this, right? Like I always tell people, a lot of homophobia is rooted in the hatred for women, right? Like if you really want to break that down to a science, like it really comes down to that. Like folks don't have issues with me. It's not about me loving another man. It's about the idea that in your mind, being mm. perpetuated as being feminine. Thus, you've been taught to hate women. So me being queer and a feminine is something you hate, right? Because you're supposed to be a man. Um, and there's all these, these nuggets that are there. And I, so I, I see that when you start talking about sexism as a whole, we get into rape culture, we get into, you know, we get into the idea of what masculinity is as a whole. It is really set around this concept of power, which again, ties right back into white supremacy, right? Who holds the power? And so I tweet a lot about this, right? I ask myself and I tell people this and I truly mean this when I say it. I ask myself every single day, Dr. Higgins, do you want liberation or do you just want privilege? And I will say that so many people, specifically black men, want privilege white. instead of liberation white women yes. right white women do the, do it too they play that they play that game of well i'm you know i'm i'm minoritized because i'm a woman but they'll play the game of power and and white supremacy and sexism too to be able to uphold their system that they the, uphold the systems that they're in so i think that that's really what when talking about you know this core notion of like what is the definition of sexism to me it really ties to this notion of who gets the in a way i don't know if you've ever watched um what what movie was that and they had that rain stick there was a movie about a rain stick and they were passing it around to different um uh, people it's like this stick and they were so happy some some i forget what movie it was but all in all to say of that like that's that rain stick per se is what i like to think of as like sexism it's this notion or power right who gets the power stick 
and how is it being passed around and who gets to who gets to say i have you i have the power right like that's really what it comes down to and i think that's the thing we're not talking enough about right um the dominance the the idea of of coming off stronger or presumably appearing stronger in order to maintain the power um and i put quotations around power per se so yeah, well, circles. Well, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think the way that what was coming through for me as you were describing that brain stick in particular is this idea of power and privilege over liberation is that there's a limited amount of power mm -hmm. and privilege. and so if someone has it, it or if someone doesn't have it that's because someone else does have it. And so the only way to get it is to take it away from someone. Mm -hmm. Whereas li liberation is boundless. There's right. plenty. There's, you know, there's no limit to how, how much of that there is. And so this idea that, that anyone would be striving to like, you know, uh, step on as many people as they need to, to get to this power, like that's just not the way that, that I think it actually needs to work. That's just mm -hmm. the way that has historically worked, at least, you know, from, from what I can tell. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, yeah. And it's, I always like to tell people too, it's not by, I mean, even when we think about racism as a whole and even just everything that's happened with, you know, Roe and everything that's been happening with, you know, policing and all of that. Right. My biggest thing has always been, none of this is happening by, um, by accident, right? It's all by design. It is all meant to, in some way, shape, or form, inform you that you are powerless, right? Um, it's 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 a way to, like you said, maintain dominance. And so, when we really talk about what sexism is, right? This notion of um, I even had saw something very interesting last night on Twitter where someone had said there are more regulations on women's bodies than there are, or cis, or, or bodies with um, with ovaries than yeah. there are on gun laws, right? And so there's just this notion that somebody always has to be oppressed. And, 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 and when we talk about that concept, right, of somebody needing to be oppressed, it's, it's, in, it's in order for someone to maintain a dominant force. And so a lot of sexism is rooted in this notion of it's not even about the, the autonomy or it's not even about what body you're in, right? It's ultimately this notion of how do I control you? How do I make you feel like you're less than me? How do I make you feel like you're not worthy? Um, what are the ways that I can basically, again, gaslight and manipulate your, your the way you think or the way you even feel about yourself? Um, so that way you're not my way. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So this idea, I, I, I want to kind of, circle back to this idea of gaslighting something yeah. that you know the way that i talk about consent is like i think that the sort of working definition or the, the you know colloquial definition of consent is that it's like or understanding is that it's something that you do with someone else like it's something right. that you need to with other people mm -hmm. and the way that i teach it and something that's really important to me is this idea that it's first and foremost something that we need to practice with ourselves right and, you know, we're, we're, we've been talking about this idea of like being gaslit by society, by the media, et cetera. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in this idea. And, you know, I've caught myself doing this and I'd love to hear your thoughts on the idea of gaslighting yourself, mm -hmm. how that happens. And I'll give just like a little bit of where I'm coming from, um, which is that I just read this amazing book called Turn the World Inside Out by Nora Samaran. It's about attachment theory. Um, and it's, it's a bit gender reductive, which she even addresses in an interview with a trans woman within the book um, in like the latest edition. Uh, but so what, what she talks about in this, uh, in this, in this one essay about gaslighting, she talks about how people with avoidant attachment styles tend to gaslight people with anxious attachment styles. Like you shouldn't hmm. need, you know, you're, uh, you're relying too much on me or you need too much or, um, uh, or like, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not avoiding you, so on and so forth. And, and when she talks about it, it sort of, she sort of casts this very wide net that like men 
tend to be avoidant and women tend to be anxious. And so I took this reading and, and made it a little more granular and a little more internal. And I was starting to look at this idea that the avoidant parts in me gaslight the anxious parts in me. Mm, mm -hmm. So like that is a, is a, um, is a conversation that's happening within my own body and within my own mind where the parts, I, yeah. What, I, I, yeah. It clicked for me. Yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I think so. You know, one of the things I'll say here is that I, always growing up um and it's interesting because my mom is here hey mom um but there is growing up I was always told that I talked a lot um mm. you know you you always have something to say you 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 know why are you always talking you jabber too much that was one of the things that I always heard as a kid and what I learned as I started to get older was like I got to a point in my life where I actually stopped talking because I was gaslighting myself to think that I really did talk too much, that I was too vocal, that, you know, I annoyed people. And I struggle with that now too, right? Like, you know, how much is it truly me being annoying or how much of it is really me just me being myself and people not, you know, not, not vibing with it. But to, to, to go back to that point, I think when you talk about that, that self gaslighting, right? really learning that a lot of it was the reason why so many people had problems with me talking as a kid was because I was asking questions that kids shouldn't be asking. Yes. That I ultimately was not afraid to see something wrong and point it out. That I was that kid that called people like, and I've always been by just naturally. And I, it, there's a part of me that loves it. And there's a part of me that really can't fucking stand it. I am an empath by, by nature. And so people tend to overshare to me all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's, they'll just walk up to me and I'm like, Hey, how are you doing? And, oh, I'm good. You know, yesterday my dog died. And then, you know, I got hit with monkey pox and I'm like, girl, I didn't even know all that. But I'm just saying like by nature, like people for some reason gravitate towards me and tell me their life. But I say all of this to say, I'm also very, very in tune with people's energies. And I've always been that way. And so I can read when someone is a, in my mind, a good person versus not. And so I would speak up on that as a kid, like something about this person does not rub me the right way. Um, and my mom or my uncles or my cousins or whatever, John, you, you know, again, you talk too much. You shouldn't have said that. You, you know, you got to be nice to these people. You, you, they're family, right? That was one of the favorite things that a lot of people in my family love to you. you they're family. You can't be mean to them. I'm like, just because they're family doesn't mean they're not shitty people, right? Um, and so, I, and I call at, 11, 12, 13 years old, I was calling people out on their stuff. Because again, I, I, that's just who I am. And so I think when you start talking about this gaslighting, right, that, that happens within ourselves, um, I think about it from this standpoint of, and again, this goes back to the notion of sexism, all the moments in my life where people really was trying to make me feel small, where people mm -hmm. were really trying to, to, to really just kind of do this to my voice, Right, not not even silence me, but really kind of push me to the back, so that well, yeah, yeah, because it's easy, it's really easy, you know. I'm an adult, and you're a child, and you're an, you need to stay in a child's place. Well, what does that really mean, right? Power. I'm a, I'm older than you, you know, and I I'm telling you what you can and can't say, so that way I can protect myself as an adult who honestly is not wanting to do the work that I need to do to be a better person, right? Mm -hmm. That, that's really what it comes down to. And so I have always been that person where I can see through that for, for people. And it's not to say that sometimes I'm wrong. I'm not going to come through and act like I'm this all holy being person that doesn't have their own faults. However, I'm in therapy. However, I'm on medication. Like I'm doing the work that I need yeah. to do to be a better person in this world. And so that was for me as a child, that's all I was asking other people to do. Like Stop being such a terrible person. And so I think ultimately that's what, what really happens with this whole like gaslighting ourselves. A lot of it is, you know, I, I, I even, I've, I've even asked this when I'm in queer spaces with people. I've said, you know, when's the first time you were told to be quiet? Um, mm -hmm. And what does that, what did that moment, what did that, that, that situation feel like for you? Um, and when you really start unpacking that, right? That notion of how it really starts in the first grade 
uh, when you have a teacher tell you to sit there and be silent. It's this notion of they are trying to, in a lot of ways, they're trying to get you to align and to, um, to assimilate to the ways that we work in this world, right? You're to be seen and to not be heard. So when you are a queer little boy like myself, who's very vocal and very sure of themselves, they want to knock me down a notch because ultimately sexism and all these other pieces and all these other things are telling me that I shouldn't be who I am. Um, and I think that that's the hard thing about this world is, is really just asking yourself, I'll say this and then we can move on to the next point. I think really asking yourself mentally, is it truly me that has the issue or is this something that was put on to me that I've interpreted as it being a truth for me that I have to unlearn? That's the hard, that shit is hard because I sometimes will stop and I'll go, am I really loud? Or am I just really sure of myself and people mm. don't like that, right? Like I have to, and it's this constant game that you're having to play with yourself because you're going, am I really a judgmental asshole? Or do I see something about that person that ain't right that needs to be fixed. And they trying to make me feel like I'm the one with the issue. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Like it, it be like the, the mental gas, like the mental gaslighting game, right? It always comes back to who said what to maintain yes. what, right? And what were so, their motives? What right. was the motive? Yeah, what yeah. was the motive? Right, yeah. what was the motive? Yeah, okay, so two things I wrote down while you were talking. One is that I have such a clear memory in fifth grade of being told by my teacher that I ask too many questions and need to be quiet. Yes, yes. Really stuck with me. The second thing, and, and you know, this comes up a lot in my work with consent and boundaries and all these things, um, is the, like, the way that when, like, kids have really acute and powerful <laughs> neuro which for any you know our autonomic nervous system's unconscious ability to gauge safety and danger yeah um, and it's very tied to our intuition and because our society doesn't prioritize feeling and emotion and instinct instead we prioritize like logic and reason and intellect and things like that a lot of adults will gaslight young kids who have really strong intuitions because the parents have had that part of themselves squashed. Right. And so they can't see what the kids are seeing. And so they'll make the kid feel like they're crazy or imagining something. Mm -hmm. And the kid learns that they can't really trust their gut, that their instincts are bad, that their intuition is like, you know, mystical and like not real. Um, and then a lot of my adult life has been like getting that back, yeah. which is, very hard, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the person does something and you're like, God damn it, I, I was right. Really, I said <laughs> God damn it, I was right. I knew that person was full of shit. Like, yes. you know, so it's it's just, yes, it is very much that. And I, and I laugh because I think the biggest thing is really thinking about it when we think about th this concept of who we are. It's funny because I always tell people, I think the biggest aha I had about the way I was taught to show up in this world really came to me. I don't know if any of you, or I don't say any of you, the, the folks that are watching or even yourself, um, Mia, but uh, The Mask, you know, the, the Mask We Live In is a documentary that was um, on Netflix. And a lot of people... A lot there there are a lot of critiques in that in that documentary. I want to give that that yes, there are a lot of very valid critiques that people have made about that documentary. But what I will say um, is that part of that documentary actually informed the dissertation that I wrote in mm. regards to how we think about men and masculinity and the ways the ways that people show up. And this notion that I remember very clearly when I first started working um, in one of my jobs, I had a supervisor who constantly told me, John, you need to check your emotions because you wear your emotions on your sleeve. And I remember... I remember being so caught up in like, am I being overly emotional in this moment? Am I being overly emotional in this moment? Am I being over? And then when I stepped back from that, I said, oh, I said, that's that internalized misogyny. I did, and I didn't know that. I didn't, I didn't have the language at the time, right? 
to talk yeah. about what internalized, because again, I didn't even know what the fuck misogyny was at the time. Mm. But as I've grown, I go back to that thought a lot of, John, you're so passionate and you're so angry and you're speaking up about this. And, you know, John, you wear your emotions on your sleeve. And I'm like, damn right, I wear my emotions on my sleeve because people need to know that this shit is wrong, that this, that this does not feel good to me. And I think we've gotten so accustomed to trying to make it seem like emotions is a feminine thing when we are all dealing with yeah. the same emotions, right? Whether they be good or bad, we all have the right to say this. This does not feel good to me. So that's where the conversation about boundaries come into this conversation, right? The notion that you have a lot of men that are doing really shit. And I say men, specifically, cis men, even in the queer community. I have seen numerous posts about men being in clubs and feeling like they have the right to grab someone else's private parts, that they have the right to touch them. Um, I, I saw someone on TikTok talking about you know, men, when you asked me to move, it was, a, it was a cis woman who was talking about this. You don't have to touch my hips to tell me to move, right? Um, it's, it's that kind of stuff that I think about when I talk about the ways that we are all kind of, and the idea that there's so many people who don't say anything about it. That's right. to me, when we get back to this conversation about emotions, right? This, this idea that there are so many people who have experienced so many different microcosms of misogyny noir or misogyny um, or sexism or rape culture. And they've been taught to just tuck those emotions away as if it's just a normal thing. And I'm like, I wish somebody would run up on me and touch me in, inappropriately and think that I'm not going to say nothing about it. Like that, that for me is where I'm at. So, you know, that's just the thought I had. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like this idea of like, is it, is it me or is it the media? Ah, like, yeah. like where, where is that coming from? Where did I learn? Is yeah. that, that feel true to me or is it something that I learned? And, you know, I come back to this idea so often, mm -hmm. which like, there, like, there are so many people who would rather stay in the matrix. Mm -hmm. And you can't, drag them out of the matrix you know like they and and so much of the matrix is the media it's like so mm -hmm. so much of the learned behaviors and the learned rules of how to be in society and how to be who you should be in order to attract who you should attract etc cetera, etc cetera. and i i i see it over and over again there's just there's a way that a lot of this work and a lot of like this conversation that we're having is really terrifying mm -hmm. um, because it's like if you if you take like the cork out of the boat, it's like the whole thing. You know, it's like it's like the last, it's like the in Jenga or something. It's like that last the whole, piece. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fall down, and then you're gonna have to rebuild. And like what I think is maybe missing from the conversation is like how beautiful and exciting it is to rebuild. Mm -hmm. I think. That daunting because people are like how do you do that I don't you know I don't want to go there because then I have to pick up the pieces and I might lose friends and I might lose this and I might not be able to um you know repress my horrible feelings about my job anymore and I might need mm -hmm. to change my life and it's like yeah yeah you might. yeah you might, you might. And, and the world I think when we get to that conversation is that the world this is something I, I mean, th there are two thoughts that I have as I was listening to you, right? So the stuff that, you know, so it's funny because one of the, one of the proposals that I had pitched for, like I said, I'm in the process of trying to write this book. And one of the pitches that I had, I, that I'm, that I've thrown out there that I'm really thinking about, or actually I wouldn't even say I'm thinking, I actually am going to be writing about it. Um, it <laughs> is, you know, the ways that media, you know, I, I, so I don't know if you watch Love on the Spectrum, but there was a, <clears throat> there was a person on the show who had said that life is not like the movies. And I think that we hear that, but no one ever really truly like talks about that and internalizes what that means. And I think even for me, right, from coming up as a queer kid in San Bernardino, I thought I was going to be Will Truman. I thought that my love was, my life was going to look like, you know, I'll go to college and it'll be fun and people will love me and everything will be great after I finish college. And then, and 
and, and, and no, none of that happened. And I think that's what happens is, is I think we are sold a false fallacy. And it's not to say that it's anyone's fault that we take on this as truth, right? But we internalize media as truth a lot. And so one of the things that we internalize through media is this the, is the binary itself, right? How are women supposed to perform and how are men supposed to perform? And there is no in between. And so when you get someone like myself who kind of straddles the line of both the masculine and the feminine, there are a lot of people who don't know what the fuck to do with me because they because I, I don't I don't fall into the bracket of masculinity or femininity. And I also don't play the different roles, right? So even when I'm even when I'm performing, and I say performing in the sense of I'm dressed down, right? I have on a t-shirt and I have on some jeans and I'm just kind of going about my day, right? I'm not in the emotional state to want to throw on some heels in a dress to deal with the shit that comes with having on heels in the dress, right? If I'm in just, if I'm downplaying how I look, right? There are still people who don't know what to do with me because I'm very outspoken, because I say what I, I say what I mean and I mean what I say, um, because I speak so freely with my hands and that's because I just paid $50 to get my nails done so y'all niggas gonna see it like that kind of stuff right like there are a lot of things that people can't they can't they 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 need me to fit into a box for them and even down to like i it's funny it's related but it's not related the ways i hear women say sorry all the time mm -hmm. like how normalized that is that women have to and i say women in the sense of like both trans and not, like, I mean, cis women and trans women, I hear them apologize all the time. And I'm going, girl, what are you sorry for? <laughs> like, you walk past them and you, excuse me, oh, I'm so sorry. And it's like, no, don't be sorry. You are shopping in Target like me. I walk <laughs> past you. I said, excuse me, girl, you don't need to be sorry about standing in my way. Right. And so I think like that's the kind of stuff I'm thinking about. Like we are just so we are, we we literally from the time that even just down to this whole notion of what love is supposed to look like for us, right? This fairy tale Cinderella, like nothing that the world told me my love was gonna look like ever happened. Um my relationship doesn't look like what it is on the TV. Um and I think you know it's 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 cute and it's fun, right, to to have that escape to be able to watch TV, to be able to watch film. Um, shout out to Johnny, they're on Queer as Folk. I see that they're here. You know, oh. to have those moments where you can you can step back from reality and, and live in someone else's world for a moment. But what I think is the problem is that a lot of these stories, because there are no real true stories that are out there for us. And when I say us, I say as Black people or queer people or because media seems so afraid to tell the truth we start to live in the fallacy of these created worlds that are out there. And now you can't, your real world is you're going, I don't know what the fuck to do with this world that I have because everything I've been fed is a lie, right? Yeah. Like maybe that man, maybe th that dream man you have will never come. What do you do, right? Like, what do you do? And so I just think about that a lot. Like I think about the ways that we, we are, it's, it's intentional misleading. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I can say it. it's a digital misleading. Very often for profit. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone money off of that misleading. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. I mean, my mind is spinning, and I feel like I could talk to you for hours. Um, but I feel like we should we should wrap up. Yeah. Um, if I. Yeah. I mean, I I really I've like took so many notes, and I feel like I could I could say so much more, but I, I want to keep it, you know, relatively brief and thank you yeah. so much for your time. No problem. Yeah. I think the biggest thing that I will say too, I, I, I think it's so important to just say this and then we can hop off. Um, I think that the one thing to keep in mind too is we are never not done with becoming our best selves. And I think that's something that we don't talk enough about. Um, like I tell people all the time, it was a trans woman, a trans black woman who checked me about my transphobia. Um, mm. It is 
my friend Jordan who holds me accountable when I'm being fat phobic. Um, mm -hmm. It is my friend. Like we, we, we all have these things that we have to work on. And so for folks who are watching that feels like, oh, I'll never get to that place that I'll be like perfect. Like what is perfect or what is perfection? Or, you know, how do I unlearn my sexism? How do I unlearn all of this? It is a true work in progress. And I really want people to start giving themselves, like I think that's what the empathy piece, give yourself the, 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 the space and the capacity to really interrogate all of the stuff you believe the, and, and why you believe it and how you believe it. Um, and, and what are the things that you genuinely don't want, slow, nor what do you truly not believe anymore? Um, I think a big thing I've been interrogating is why have I been so fearful to be feminine all these years, right? Um, this idea that there's something inherently wrong with me being a feminine you know, male-bodied person. Um, that is something I'm constantly interrogating. But I always tell people too, like when we get back to what I need to unlearn, I tell people I'm unlearning my sexism. I'm unlearn. I'm working to unlearn my transphobia. I'm working to unlearn my fat phobia. Like we all have to be okay with this idea that everything that we know and what we believe to be true may not be true, and we may have to do work to unlearn that truth. So, I just wanted to yeah, there. I. I really love that point. I, I experience that myself. I mean, truly on the daily and I'm so grateful for the friends in my life who will tell me like, Hey, that thing you said was not great. And here's why, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, have conversation and like stick around while I figure out how to do better. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's really easy, like, especially on the internet to look at people who teach, especially, um, as like, well, if, you know, if you're fucking it up, then like, why am I learning from you? And it's like, that's the wrong approach to learning, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. we're, all, mm -hmm. we're all helping each other fuck up better and yeah. get through and mm -hmm. learn. Um, and, and I, the, the last thing that I wanted to say is that, you know, you were talking about like how you were told as a kid that you talk too much and all these things that people were like telling you was wrong. And I, I see your career as like the incredible like garden that has grown out of all of those things. Like you've made a career being completely true to yourself. And I think I have so much admiration for people who do that. I strive to do that myself. And I think every time I find a new thing where I'm like about me, you know, where I'm like, Oh, that's going to like alienate people or like make people feel like I'm like too specific or like not relatable it actually does the complete opposite oh baby yes yeah. that's so real that is so real and for people who are watching there are going i always like to say this people this this is something that i have just learned in the last year that there are a lot of people who will try to put out your light because they see how powerful it is right. and that is what that is what oppression is right mm -hmm. so when you show up in your full self and you show up as confident, and you show up in this notion of, yeah, I'm a perfect fucking mess, right? That's yeah. perfect, I'm a perfect fucking mess. And I ultimately am doing everything that I can to navigate this really, this, this world that was never built for me, right? It was never built with me in mind. It was never built with, with it was never, I, I was not supposed to make it, that, right? Like, I was not supposed to be here. I think that that is when you really, truly start to understand that there are so many other people who are going to look at you and say, that light is what I need. That light I have to follow because I'm over here in the dark, right? Somebody else put my light out. Um, and I, I, I have to say shout out to Quinta because I, 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 I will always remember when Quinta, Quinta, obviously we all know who Quinta is. Um, yeah. When Quinta Brunson reached out to me and said, who was the person that, uh, basically in so many words, I forget what Quinta said to me, but she said something to the Avell of like, who was the first person that told you that you weren't, um, how, did, how did she frame it? Um, basically, who was the first person that broke your soul, right? Mm -hmm. That's that's what she she ultimately, and I can think of mm -hmm. family and friends and people who, who tried to break me when I was a child. And I now as an adult, I can understand and I go, that's because they saw something in me that really made them like fearful or really not like they were so uncomfortable in who they were. They were like, let's snuff this little boy's light out. Right. And so being cautious of those people, being cautious of those, those memories, not letting them take too much space up in your life. Um, I, I think that that's the thing for me is like, I will recall on a, a very fucked up thing that happened to me, but I don't let it 
take up too much space and residency in my head. Um, because we all, we all, we are all out here to inspire somebody else. We, we have no idea who we're, in, who we're inspiring. And so um, I just, I was like, Sam, just trying to be that light for someone else because I didn't have it. Yeah. Know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, that's so important. Yeah. But oh. this was great. Thank you for asking oh, me to be here. I'm really happy that we were able to make this work and I really, truly really appreciate cool. it. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. John. I'll talk to you very soon. Do you have anything that you want to plug before we go? Oh, of course. Uh, who doesn't want to plug things when they go on things? Um, so if you want to hear more of me talking cash shit, um, my podcast, Black Fat Femme, comes out on iHeartRadio July 12th. Um, that has been literally the thing that has been taking up all of my life. Um, I don't have a, a I, I wish I had a book to be like, oh, you know, go pre-order my book. Um, but she's working on a book. She's writing. Um, you can follow me at Dr. John Paul um, on all social media. Um, and if you want to work with me, if you want to engage with my content, um, I am, like I said, I'm back to freelancing. So shout out to the girls who are out here uh, shooting out invoices if there are anything <laughs> If you would love to work with me on a project or you would love to work with me um, in terms of writing something around this concept of, of owning your, you know, owning the autonomy that you have and owning the greatness that you are, um, you can reach me by my website. But other than that, I'm just really happy and thankful to be here. Um, thank you, everybody. There are some folks who are in the comment section that have been what I like to call you, including you, you have been a day one. Um, there have been so many people in the, in, that have literally been there with me since the beginning and are now seeing stuff sprout. And it's just really cool to, to be here. So thank you. Beautiful. The love is there. All right. Well, thank you for having me and I'll see you soon. For being here. All right. Bye, Bye babies.